You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are here discussing Benjamin Stevenson's new novel, Everyone on This Train is a Suspect, chapters 1 to 11 and a half. Herds. 11 and a half? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, we're going to be uh, chatting about Ernest Cunningham, who is returning for more murder shenanigans. He says he cannot write a book unless there is a murder, therefore there must be a murder. And we are joined today in studio by Dr. Kate Evans. You might know her from ABC Radio National's The Bookshelf or from being much cooler than us. Kate, it's wonderful <laughs> to have you. <laughs> no, I fear I'm actually going to be the daggy curmudgeon in this discussion. <laughs> and although on the whole I'm quite a generous reader, my eye-rolling with parts of this book, uh, you know, I was doing an Angela Merkel. Well, we'll see how long it takes us to throw you out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, of course, in this stretch of chapters, we actually get to meet our cast. We have Ernest and Juliet who return from the previous book in the series. They both wrote books about what happened in the last book. They have their own separate accounts, yes. but only Ern has been invited onto the train to talk about his book. Yes. Because um, this is mobile writers festival traveling the the length of Australia. From Darwin to Adelaide on the GAN, which is a real train. Gann. It's a real thing. I've been advertised it many a time after reading this novel. <laughs> yeah. And we get to meet all the other writers as well that are part of this journey. Uh, and of course, Henry McCavish, who's our star blockbuster writer and also our murder victim. Yeah, we... Uh, we see him perish during his standalone Horribly. special panel on his detective Morbund. Uh, mm. he, he throws up all over <laughs> his number one fan's copy of Misery. Poor Brooke. But yeah, we, we basically get to meet everyone, have our first few days on the train. First leg, yeah, of the journey. We have one very spicy panel where everyone's mm. kind of biting at each other and showing that they, they don't necessarily like or have read each other's work. Now, this is where, again, I'm going to be the worst guest you've ever had <laughs> because I didn't read the first book. And from that impression, Ernest Cunningham as a character, how did he feel for you on that first introduction? Funny, smart ass, telling us all what to think, fine, and then at a point at about 10 pages in mm-hmm. where I went, okay, I'm out. What, what was the point? <laughs> what was the stickler for you? Well, actually, can I just say first what what I liked about Absolutely. the beginning. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's get a, a good impression going. Yeah. So because, um, you know, the setup is that there is an Australian Mystery Writers Festival held on a train and after a prologue where he's talking about the publishing process, we then actually get the bios of all of the writers on that train. Now, they really do this. I mean, there are various writer trains that have gone around the country. What I liked is I am totally familiar with this type of writer's bio. I have (laughs) written this type of bio um, for my own, you know, radio interviews for stuff that I've read. And I thought he cracked that. And not only that, he's giving us types. And I found that extremely funny. So Lisa Fulton, best-selling debut novelist. She is currently working on her long-awaited second novel, SF majors, we get the poignant point that you know the publicists have said, tell them about this, it'll be the hook for the story. She grew up rereading the only three books in her tiny town school library. Of course she did. And now she lives in the Blue Mountains with her partner and two dogs. Of course she does. I I also (laughs) like that SF Majors is the the coordinator of the festival. So, of course, her bio is the longest of anybody's by exactly (laughs) two words. If you left the dogs out, it it wouldn't make a difference. So I thought this was terribly funny. So I was totally with him. And then as he's talking about all the things that are going to happen, like there are pointers on if there are so many pointers Mm. we are readers who are used to finding these things so that drove me a bit crazy but then he gives us the rap sheet for the crimes committed in this book and this is in the context of a tone that is you know funny light-hearted I'm showing you how clever I am the rap sheet amounts to murder attempted murder rape stealing trespassing evidence tampering call me an old-fashioned feminist please don't list rape and murder in that lighthearted way without annoying the bejesus out of me. So page 10, I went, okay, I'm out. Yeah. No, I think that's very fair. And it's one of the really interesting things that Benjamin Stevenson does in all of his books from either side of midnight, everyone in this family is, uh, everyone in my family's killed someone in this book is that the 
contrast between light and dark is jarringly broad. He's got a really interesting relationship with violence as it's depicted in the novel, not just in you know, the description of what happens broadly, but also in the details. There is a, a passage where he's talking about the, the first kill that happens in the novel where Ern is describing it as violent, but there's no gore or evisceration or anything. And it feels like Stevenson is, is kind of justifying his kill as not being that that violent. It's more of a goof when one of the authors pukes his entire guts out all over the stage, you know? Which goes really well over the dinner table, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting because he has slightly yet noticeably different approach to what is inappropriate in these sorts of stories. Well, and also I was then struck by my own hypocrisy in that because I do read crime fiction and one of the confronting things about crime fiction is the way in which you are reading violence and how you decide to respond to it. And I thought, well, does it matter that he is always playing around with all of this and always being flippant because is that what the genre does? But it's such a knowing voice and I guess the question is, is it taking us along for the ride or excluding us? I mean, did it take you along for the ride? Well, I think the thing for me is that the way that Benjamin Stevenson writes these books is that he sets himself and the audience a challenge in that he rolls the dice and says, here is the list of the horrible things that will happen and these are uncomfortable things and it's then up to Benjamin Stevenson to justify those horrible things being in the book. It's one of the interesting things for us doing a show about crime fiction is that when we talk about it, how do we do that without spoiling the book? How do we juggle these things? So we tend to leave it to our audience to just trust that like, if you have to pull out, pull out, and we respect that decision. But Benjamin Stevenson sort of puts it in the beginning of the book. Their flippancy does sort of undermine the context of that. But it then comes down to how much perhaps do you trust Benjamin Stevenson or Ernest Cunningham to bring that around and make that flippancy worthwhile in the end. Yes, because it's not a sensitivity warning. It's more, it's a plot point warning. It's a, what is this genre? It is, do you understand that we are in a a locked train or it's a golden age mystery or- Closed circle. Yeah. So it's it's all about the genre, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. And so, you know, the fact that he knows the genre and knows whether we like a mystery or a clue or a puzzle or an anagram or a whatever, that was great. Mm. I just didn't need him to point it out to me quite so many times. Like he could have set it up and then just paired it back after about, I don't know, chapter two. I, I think it works personally. I think this works. I'm going to defend this man to the death apparently. Oh, good. I don't know that's my role now. I, I think it works because it causes problems for Ern. We haven't obviously f- finished the story, but there's one really big moment later on where Ern makes an atrocious blunder because he's trying to live his life by a set of murder mystery codes. And the other authors on the train don't respect him. They think that he's made up the story or he's stealing it from somebody else or whatever. He's, or they think that he's a killer. <laughs> or they think that he's a killer. Like, Nobody actually believes that his funny, wacky comedy murder story actually happened, which is fair. And it's also so interesting in this book because in the last book, as we kind of see through Andy in the beginning of this story, his family is a collection of cartoon character oddballs. It's true. And suddenly he's trying to write a story about a bunch of ordinary people. (laughs) Ordinary people in quotation marks there. But yes, more normal than his family, as in a bunch of writers stuck in a train together for several days. But not just a bunch of writers, a bunch of crime writers. And so that is another nice element of it, that these are all people who, in theory, know how to solve a crime, know how to commit a crime, know how to get away with a crime. But in fact, of course, writing about crime doesn't mean that you'd be an effective murderer. Yeah. It just means that you can create a world that behaves by a certain number of rules. As I was starting to read this, I was also thinking about Agatha Christie's novel, oh, and whose name has just gone out of my head, the one where everybody is killed in a sequence. And, and then there were none? none. Yes. yes. And so because I was thinking about that, I actually thought, all of the writers were going to be killed. Mm. And it takes a very long time for anybody to be killed. I was thinking, come on, well, haven't, I mean, haven't he we does, got five he, or six writers here? If you'd here? been counting all of the words, Kate, you would have known exactly when it was going to happen. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I think the other thing about that that's sort of fun is the way that we do then have to deal with this 
book being about a particular premise of the crime writers, but then still keeping all of the other characters feeling valid and real. Well, and Ernest's girlfriend, who we don't see a whole lot of in this. I mean, perhaps she was there, I think she might have been there more in his first novel, but she actually comes across as a pretty great character. And I'm on side when she gets exasperated with him, I have (laughs) to say. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I do love the way that, like, Ernest, the way that he's written as a character in the book, even though he's writing, he could be as generous as he wants with himself, still admits to all of the horrible things that he does in the story and especially in their relationship. So much of the meta text of him saying, well, this is going to happen soon, is him f- telegraphing how bad he feels about what he's about to do to Juliet. Well, and even the fact that there are times when she says, oh, please tell me you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that, are you? (laughs) Really? No, it's not a good idea, is it? And he goes, and yet I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm, Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that did entertain me, I will confess. We are talking Benjamin Stevenson. Everyone on this train is a suspect here with Dr. Kate Evans. Oh, don't call me doctor. Just call me Kate. Just Kate? Do you like yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, right, please. Well. Oh, well, unless you want to. I mean, listen, you worked You worked for that doctor. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with more in just a second. Stick around on your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are joined in studio by the criminal mastermind himself, Benjamin Stevenson, comedian extraordinaire, writer of the Everyone series of Bookspan. Thank you so much for joining us no on the worries. show. There was a pause there between criminal and mastermind. I just want everybody to appreciate that. <laughs> An Oxford comma of a pause. An Oxford comma of a pause. Yeah. Exactly that long. So, so Ben, uh, we actually attended a writers' convention with you this year in November in the form of Bad Sydney, which you can listen to uh, our conversation on the podcast online now. And I have to say, it wasn't nearly as murder-filled as your book has led me to think it would be. Um, how does your returning protagonist, Ernest Cunningham, manage to stay on point in a situation that may not be as normal as a detective fiction uh, has led us all to believe. You mean how does he not get distracted from solving the case by Pretty all the shenanigans around How does around the man him? not break down from what is apparently a very strange circumstance to be involved in a murder sequence? Because he's done it twice now. Yeah. Well, I think that's sort of part of the fun of the books is that he's sort of acknowledging how many times can this keep happening to me? You know, how many impossible <laughs> murders can I sort of stumble into in um, glorious and you know, arguably tax deductible for the author locations that he <laughs> finds himself in. So part of the fun of that is riding himself through that. But in Everyone on this Train is a Suspect, he is desperately wanting to write a book. And then, you know, he's sort of bubbling away across the two books is that, well, if I'm not in these to write them all down, to leave a legacy, to leave the fingerprints of the people that have died, then what am I doing in these books? I didn't really think about it while I was writing it, but then once you finish a book, for me anyway, once I finish a book, the themes sort of reveal themselves to me and I go, oh, yeah, maybe Ernest is feeling this and maybe that does carry through the two of them. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how um, Ernest has his own perspective um, knowing that he's going to write about this book in the future, but the other characters also kind of play into that. Like, I think we will get more into this in future weeks, but um, there's characters like Lisa Fulton who they uh, want to talk to Ern about their own stories and to kind of make sure that the way that they're portrayed in the novelization is the way that they want to be portrayed, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, and that's a really that was a really good gold mine as a crime writer because you sort of can have characters say, don't put me in the book. And then you think, why doesn't Simone want to be in the book? Or, yeah. or why does Lisa concerned about how she's portrayed or what will be spoken of? But then there's also a lot of fun as well because, you know, Alan Royce wants to solve the mystery first because he wants to write the book of it. He also doesn't necessarily believe that Ernest went through what he did in the first book. So you get all these kind of layers of suspicions and competitiveness. And that was one of the things I really wanted in this book with six writers um, and five detectives is the sort of pitch. I wanted the competitiveness between all five of the writers on who would be the one to solve the crime and that kind of keeps it... That keeps Ernest motivated because he wants to win. He wants to beat them. Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of that competitive spirit, one of the interesting things that I've seen in a bunch of reviews of both books and also with Kate Evans, who's joining us on the show for these episodes, is people having a really hard time sort of dealing with the barrage of references and meta texts. Like, do you have any tips that you've found by engaging with readers about how to survive such a metafictionally dense novel? Yeah, well, I think that... So I try and write it on two levels, right? So the metafiction is that Ernest is giving you the rules to the 
the puzzle that you need to solve. So the way I see it is mystery books are Sudokus and specifically in my books, Ernest is the guy that puts in all the numbers that you need to be able to solve the puzzle yourself. But I would also say that the way that I write them I try and write it for people who don't read books like that, who don't want to really forensically go through all of the anagrams and ciphers and puzzles. I always overwrite the kind of metafictional or the point and look here kind of clues Mm. in the first draft and then I take them out because they're really fun and I really like them and readers like being involved in the puzzle but there can't be too many of them that they spoil the book and also nothing can get in the way of the plot. That's my personal rule. Yeah, I remember, I think it was in the comments on the first book that someone compared it to a bit of a pen and teller routine where their whole shtick is giving away so much of the game that they can misdirect you from what their game actually is. Absolutely. I mean, I'm telling you things so that you think they're important so that you look other places but it's It's also 100% honest. The spoiler in the first book is the title of the first book. Mm. There's an event that happens in the middle of the book that makes the title dishonest if it is not true. This was the real experiment because magicians and Penn and Teller, they want you to follow what they're doing and they're sort of stripping things back and you're sort of examining it and you're aware that you're watching a magic trick. Now, crime writers, if a crime writer says to you that they're going to be honest, you're expecting them to be dishonest. Mm. So... One of the things I was really interested in was that intersection, right? I am being honest and I'm going to keep being honest and that only makes the reader doubt you more, which is actually what you want. Yeah, it's always really interesting, I guess, balancing suspects in terms of screen time. Yeah. Um, Because I I used to, long time, this is a long time ago, I used to play a lot of mafia with my friends and often the people who were in the mafia were the people who were saying very little because they're trying to slip under the radar. And yep. that's another sort of tactic that can be very effective in these sorts of these sorts of psychological mind games that you've dedicated yourself to playing with your with your audience. But how do you make it satisfying at the end of the book for the reader? Because it's sure. unsatisfying if they haven't been in it enough. Mm. And it's also unsatisfying if they've been in it a lot. Yes. Even if it's unpredictable. So the example that I use that is an ineffective twist is the vice president being the bad guy in an action movie, right? (laughs) Okay. So, you know, all those kind of Gerard Butler ones or whatever. It's always the vice president has set it up, right? And that's because they're the only other main character in the film and therefore it's unsatisfying. But in those exact same movies, when they don't have the vice president do it and they have some rando, you're like, Mm -hmm. well, this is unsatisfying because I'm not connected. So there's a gap between those two. So always in my head, I'm like, don't make it the vice president and don't make it the butler. And if you can sort of thread the needle, then that's how you get a good killer. It can always be fun to play into those tropes in a surprising way. If the vice president is also the vice president's twin or something, something ridiculous like that. Uh, anyway. <laughs> if fairly introduced early on. There we go. We Thank must fairly introduce twins at the beginning of the story. Yes, this is true. Shout out to Knox. Um, so when we asked you about Sydney about violence in your books, you mostly answered regarding Ern's previous outing in Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone. Do you really think that McTavish is vomiting? This is my bone, by the way. That McTavish vomiting all over everybody isn't violent. Yeah. Oh, no, I You're think nuts. Tra- You're I nuts. Think, <laughs> I think Train is a lot less violent than um, Everyone in My Family. But, you know, I, tr- I do try and keep violence off the, play- the page, but... Um, there are things that happen in train that are horrible, you know. Oh, yeah. I don't like to sort of graphically describe kind of things. But, um, yeah, I guess vomit is a bit extreme, but I just, <laughs> I don't know. The things that I focus on are less kind of the corpses and more the little bits. Like I love that the vomit gets on the copy of Brooks. Um, yeah. Misery, Misery by yeah. Stephen King because I just thought, okay, this binds it all together. So that's what I'm thinking about when I'm writing those nice scenes fun. rather than The Exorcist, you know. I will, I will say it. while we're talking about this particular bone, I did love the knowing mm, from the audience when we asked that question at Bad Sydney. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm also really surprised, you know, some some things in my books get more visceral responses than yeah. I'm expecting. So I'm not a parent, so yeah. I don't have kids. So the scene in Everyone in My Family has Killed Someone where the children are locked in the car mm. and they're left accidentally in the car, um, um, a lot of parents have reached out to me and said, man, that scene was incredible and it really hit me right in the heart. And mm. for me, writing that, to be perfectly honest, it's a plot point and I'm moving through the plot point and I need to think about what's going to happen to the characters and who's going to die and what's going to motivate people. But yeah. it's because I'm a different perspective, different walk of life. I wonder if you're desensitised from working with Jack Heath too closely. He kind of has the same experience. <laughs> True that, right, from yeah. children's books to FBI cannibal. Yeah, definitely. And and I think there's uh, there's certainly a bit of desensitization across the board because, you know, I've written 
several books about a lot of different things and a lot of different ways to kill people. So mm. I'm actually more thinking about is it fun and is it entertaining rather than um, what are the specifically gruesome bits of each each murder. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here talking with Benjamin Stevenson about his latest novel, Everyone on This Train is a Suspect. We're going to jump back into our conversation with Kate Evans about that very same book. In just a second, stick around. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER 107.3. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here on your murder mystery world tour aboard the GAN with Kate Evans as we talk Benjamin Stevenson's Everyone on This Train is a Suspect, chapters 1 to 11 and a half, and it's time, Herds. Mm. You and I both read this book for Bad Sydney. It was a great time. So Kate Evans is the one who will be posing theories. Oh, yeah. God, really? Yes. Yeah, you got to solve this. Oh, no. I have I'm to pretty s- sure we told you, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Well, as I said, I've had a few other deadlines in between, so I and need to are. have a theory about who's done what. Yeah, basically, at, at chapter 11 and a half, who do you think did it and why? Well, I was actually quite tempted to think that it was his girlfriend, Juliet, even though I sort She's of exempt. knew... She's <laughs> Well, I sort of knew it wasn't supposed to be, but that's part of the game of the book, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. That he was saying, well, look, these are the rules and it can't be this person and it can't be this person and the real person is going to have been mentioned 106 times or whatever. And I thought, well... Do we really know he's a reliable narrator? And so part of me wanted to think that she was involved in it. And that was partly because I was getting a little irritated with him telling me what to pay attention to. And so I thought, no, I want to pay attention to something else. I mean, what if you're wrong? I don't want to have it too signposted. Yeah. Can I, can I just read a little bit of this 11.5 we have here? <laughs> um, of course, you still don't trust me. You can't help but think I'm feeding you a batch of misdirecting red herrings to keep the truth hidden, etc. Well, red herrings, there should be red herrings in a oh, crime. No, no, no. What, what I'm saying is I, th- I think it's very interesting that you, you feel in your experience with the book that you're pushing back and you're looking at things that he's explicitly told you not to look at, but that also is part of what he expects you to do, I guess. Is there, do you think there's a way for you to win by taking that sort of tactic? How do you feel? Well, no, there's not, partly because he keeps on, he's directing us and funneling us in particular directions. And I started to get quite resistant to that, partly because I felt like, come on, is this a book or is this a late night in a bar with a bunch of friends when you're all talking about all your theories about every crime novel you've ever read, telling every joke, and he puts them all in the book, like every single one. Can you just hold back on some of them? But I guess what we do know is that, you know, we've got this Scottish writer who's died. But I guess one of the things that is clear is that there are other mysteries, that there are other questions. And so I guess when you say, what are the the mysteries, I sort of like that reaching towards a possibility rather than deciding on it. So it's clear that people aren't quite who they say they are and that this renowned, grumpy Scottish author who everybody thinks is just this fantastic writer seems like a bit of a plonker, really. But I feel like I'm not playing the game properly in terms of who the the possibilities are. Look, there are blue scarves that are are. clues. Well, there's a blue scarf, apparently, that flits about. And this is one of the fun things about the metatext of the murder mystery is we know at some point that blue scarf is going to end up next to a corpse, but we have no idea who or how or why. I also did like the other little things that he's making us think about. There, There is a whole little aside about fakery and people accusing him of having, you know, maybe faked the things that happened in the first book to the character. And then he goes on all of the conspiracies, Hiroshima survivors writing from the comfort of their imagination, a 15-year-old's diary concocted by a 54-year-old woman. And so he's talking about literary fakes. Mm. And I quite liked having that in there. I mean, both as something that the character knows about, but also as a bit of a playful question about what it is that we believe. So, I mean, there's a lot, it's a clever, it's a clever book. I feel as though a lot of the clues that were presented in this story are much more to do with what Ernest isn't seeing. So, for example, we're shown things straight to our face that are presented as clues and Ernest 
completely misses the direction of them. And because he is writing his first person perspective at that moment, we go along with his incorrect assumption. If I may, uh, <laughs> oh, one, may. Of, one of the examples I'm happy to share is that we get told that there is a word game with Archie Bench. Yes. And then immediately we say Archibald Bench after being told it's a word game and my little murder mystery reading brain went, okay, well, it's certainly not Archibald then. Aha. Uh-huh. Whereas I just wasn't quite sure what to make of it except that, yeah, there was a word game, mm. and if I'd been thinking more carefully or perhaps reading more slowly, I might have cracked <laughs> yeah. that well, one. Well, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's interesting thing about how explicitly Stevenson presents the word games. I, I still quite enjoy word games in murder mysteries, but I've definitely been spoiled on, like, more complicated ones that take several books to complete. I do appreciate the effort that goes into creating these because the way that Stevenson writes, you have the core mystery of the murder and then you have the mysteries of what are all the authors that that aren't murders or murder suspects, you know, do they have some kind of mystery that's associated with them explicitly? And then you have the lower down murders about the staff and the fans and the word games. And it creates this like hierarchy of, of puzzles that you can kind of tackle. And as in so many works of crime fiction, there's also the mystery in the past that has some relevance as well. And there's a number of those, aren't there, that we are getting clues from. And so one guy on the train, Douglas Parsons, a Texan, at some point we discover that he's walking around with a gun. Mm. And that, you know, that's that whole Chekhovian is yeah. th- there's a gun, so surely it's going to fire at some point. Mm. But that, there's actually something quite poignant about the way that that subplot is talked about and revealed, actually. I mean, even, even when, when Douglas shows up, his first act is to question Ern about the previous book, which you haven't read. But, but I've even got that, it enough. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's fair enough. But even that is bringing up another mystery that technically, legally, is not solved in the previous book. And that's what why it's being brought up here in the first place. And, and I think the other thing that's sort of engaging about the way that Ernest talks about these things happening in the past, because that's one of the things that he's very explicit about, is this thing happened 30 years ago, and boy, howdy, do you know crime fiction? Mm. Uh, <laughs> but it does sort of give you that opportunity to do that past storyline in a way that a lot of Australian crime fiction books these days would just give you a chapter in that timeline. Which is about memory and storytelling, which of course is what's also at stake. Who remembers what and which bits of themselves that they're revealing. And a lot of those characters also tell him, I don't know where we've seen much of this yet, but they tell him not to include it in the book or to include it in the book, because that is another layer of the metatext that we're dealing with, that now that a murder has happened, everyone who is genre savvy to to Ern's expectation of the genre, they say, all right, Ern, we know you're going to write a book about this, so I'd like you to portray me in this manner or in that manner, which produces another kind of layer of of tension between the characters and and mystery to solve. Yes, because that's something that, if people haven't read the book, needs to be clear, is that he's not only the narrator of this book, he is a working writer with a deadline and he doesn't yet have a story and he thinks he's writing fiction and he doesn't know how to do it. I wonder if Benjamin Stevenson felt any of these comments as he was (laughs) writing this book. There's, There's nothing of himself in this book. It's a purely detached experience writing, I'm sure. <laughs> so I suppose our working theory going into next week's chapters is, is that Juliet, Juliet, yeah, Juliet did, did it. And did, how did the why and how? How did how did she poison him and why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I don't know that I can answer that. Just Look, throw it out. There's just, nothing like just... working on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like it. Like some of my is, best solves happen on the spot. It's true. And this is where you can see that I am a reader as opposed to a writer of crime fiction. It's true. We're, we're writers, so we can. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I'm not sure that ever at this point, in, see, this is me fudging it like crazy, that at this point I would have a hypothesis rather than a series of, aha, maybe this is going to come together. But you can we can, can I, make one up on the fly can, if you can like. I, can I tell you what well, I thought? Here's, here, here's what I need oh, to say, all right? What, is what that are you saying? Herds, yeah. you agreed when Uh-oh. we signed up to have Kate on this episode. This that even if she was totally hopeless. That, that, no, well, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to sound very cool your, your points, My points, Herds points Herds for this points. season are based on on what Kate scores for this book. Oh, no, I'm putting but, you in a terrible position here. You say that, but it's based on whatever points you don't get, 
I get. So if you get zero points, I'm in getting the zero weeks, points. Then oh, I, I get can just five, give it to you right now. I get five. Well, we don't know for sure. We'll see how we go because <laughs> there is one point on the table for if you present two different theories across this episode and the next one. So if you pick a different character next week, then I lose a point. So please pick Juliet again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but it was such a lame theory that I obviously, it was, I just panicked. I panicked gonna, and I just said well, the girl It's still a theory. Herds, what are our chapters for next week on the show? Oh, goodness. We are reading from chapter 12, the beginning of forensics, to chapter 27, which is a pretty long way. But Indeed it is. I hope you'll enjoy it. We'll be back with Kate Knock Doctor Evans <laughs> next week on <laughs> the show for your murder mystery world tour talking about Benjamin Stevenson's Everyone on This Train is a Suspect. Thank you for joining us here on your Murder Mystery World Tour. We'll catch you then.